Again, I appreciate uh, being able to stand before you. I'd like to talk to you something about something that is apparently in much disfavor in the church today. And it has to do with uh, discipline. Now, lack of discipline is responsible for the chaos in which the world finds itself. Disregard for authority is evident on every hand. You can see it all around. Discipline has faded into almost complete obscurity in the affairs of nations, states, communities, and has but all disappeared from the church. No home can be strong without discipline. No church can properly function without discipline. No nation can stand if its people flagrantly disregard discipline. The early church believed and practiced discipline. It always disciplined with the right objective in mind. The early church grew and prospered because it worked constantly to maintain its purity. Discipline was used over and over to accomplish this. Today, about every sin that can be found in the world can also be found in the church. There is a tendency to wink at sin among God's children and excuse it with the excuse that to try to correct it is to meddle into other people's private lives. This is not true. It is the duty of the church to reprove, rebuke, exhort, even to call out delete, to withdraw fellowship from all who would walk in, in an unruly manner and will not repent. That was written by Foy L. Wallace as the foreword to the book by Ed Smithson called The Forgotten Commandment. Well, let's look at some uh, examples of uh, discipline. If we look at the Leviticus, the 10th chapter, first part of that, we see the uh, example of Nadab and Abihu. And it says there in Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron each took a censer and put fire in it, put incense in it, and offered profane fire before the Lord. Or as King James would say, strange fire, which he had not commanded them. Now, I'm not exactly sure what makes it be profane fire or strange fire, but I know, it is, I know it's strange because it was not authorized. And you think about it today, there's a lot of strange things. There's strange baptism, strange Lord's Supper, strange, just a strange lot of things. So anyway, the fire went out and, uh, from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. And Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people, I must be glorified. So Aaron held his peace. And you go on down further. And Moses said to Aaron and to Eleazar and Ithmar, his sons, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, lest you die, and wrath come upon all the people. So they were not allowed to mourn, or Aaron was not allowed to mourn the death of his sons because they had been disobedient to God. They didn't deserve any mourning. In Joshua, the seventh chapter, we read the account of the uh, battle with Ai and the sin of Achan. It says there, But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding their cursed things, where Achan uh, took of the accused things, so the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. And then he gives the account of the actual battle, what happened at the actual battle. And then after that battle, then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord till evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads, and he uh, appealed to God. But the Lord said, look, said, get up. Why are you lying there on your uh, face? Matters very simple. Israel has sinned, 
and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken some of the accursed things, which, and have both stolen and deceived, and they have also put it among their own stuff. That's a case where you have too much stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they had they have become doomed to destruction. That's what sin does. Neither will I be with you anymore unless you destroy the accursed thing from among you. That's discipline. Get up, sanctify the people, and say, Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow, because thus says the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. Well, they went through a process of deciding uh, or uh, determining who it was that had sinned. And through this process, Achan was taken. And then verse 20, uh, Achan answered Joshua when he uh, inquired of him. Said, uh, Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and this is what I have done. And he uh, recounted what he had done. Down in verse 24, Then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the silver, the garment, the wedge of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that he had, and they brought them to the valley of Achor. So all Israel stoned him with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. That's discipline. That was a matter of discipline and making the, the congregation pure. In the New Testament, read of the count of Ananias and Sapphira in uh, chapter 5 and verses 1 through 11. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. And what he had done, he had portrayed himself as giving all of it to the church. He wanted to be uh, looked upon as being a very generous person when in fact he was very greedy but Peter said Ananias why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself while it remained was it not your own he didn't have to say that he had given it all he could say that I've given half of it or water whatever and after it was sold was it not in your own control why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these things, these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. That was a purification process. And of course, uh, we also read about uh, Sapphira, uh, what happened to her too. What these, I mean, there are many more examples in the uh, Bible for sure. What these few examples demonstrate is that fellowship is based upon obedience to the commandments of God and that disobedience disrupts fellowship. When disobedience occurs, discipline of the offender is expected and required. Although the examples just cited resulted in the death of the offenders, the New Testament set forth, sets forth the procedures and protocols for administering discipline to the unrepentant offender. Make no mistake about it. Fellowship and the conditions for extending or withdrawing the same and the discipline required to be imposed upon the unrepentant sinner, they're serious matters. Indeed, the condition of fellowship defines the faithfulness of the Christian. The idea that faithful Christians are in fellowship with one another in Christ is a well-established tenet of the doctrine of Christ. The whole Bible from start to finish is about fellowship. From the creation when man was in fellowship with God, how that fellowship was lost, how to regain and retain it, how to treat those who lose fellowship, and who not to fellowship. In Acts the second chapter, verse 42, we read, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, 
in the breaking of bread and in prayers. This passage, among others, established the case that fellowship among and between Christians is inseparable from the apostles' doctrine. Scripturally authorized fellowship flows organically from the apostles' doctrine and from no other source. The apostle John wrote the following recorded in, the, in verses uh, 1 through 4 of the first chapter of First John. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled, concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you, that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you, that your joy may be full. John is saying that he has declared and written certain things that the apostles have seen and handled respecting the Savior that would permit his readers to have fellowship with the Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, and by extension, fellowship with them. John goes on into, in verses 5 through 7 to declare to them exactly how this fellowship is to be achieved. This is the message which we have heard from him to declare to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. What was the message heard from him and declared to the readers of John? It was that God is light and in him is no darkness. Jesus said that I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. John chapter 8, verse 12. <clears throat> this message spoke, spoken was the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints, Jude 3. It was delivered by a declaration to the saints based on revelation. As Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So the apostles all taught the same thing. The knowledge revealed to you uh, to and written by Paul is the same as the Apostles' Doctrine of Acts 2.42 and the message of 1 John 1, verse 5, heard and declared by the Apostles. Paul further wrote in Philippians, the second chapter, verses 14 through 16, to do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become a, uh, blameless and harmless, the children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. How does one shine as lights in the world? By holding fast to the word of life. Is the word of life any different from the apostles' doctrine of Acts 2.42 or the message of 1 John? or the knowledge of Ephesians 3, verse 4, or the faith once for all delivered to the saints? It is not. Furthermore, the light of the gospel is the only thing that will dispel darkness. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, only then can we have fellowship with him and one another. It is by that process of walking in the light that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses and keeps on cleansing us from all sin. But we have yet to give the definition of fellowship. <clears throat> According to the reputable, uh, reputable Greek lexicons, Thayer, Norton, Gendricks, and Robson, Bankster, et al., the word fellowship translates the noun koinia and the verb 
koinonia, which mean communion, fellowship, sharing, communication, and contribution, partaker, partner, companion, and so forth. Thus, the things shared and the ones doing the sharing are organically connected. There are two types of fellowship. One derives from walking the light, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, and the other from walking in darkness, 1 John chapter 1, verse 6. The two cannot exist at the same time in the same person. It is little wonder then that Jesus speaks of the necessity of separating the two. He said that if your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. And if you, your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. That's Matthew 18, chapter, verses 8 and 9. What is the one who is walking in the light to do with the one who is not walking in the light, that is, walking in darkness? As Jesus said and Paul writes, there must be separation. In 2 Corinthians the 6, chapter, verses 14 through 18, Paul wrote, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? And what part has an unbeliever with a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We were called into the fellowship of Jesus, as Paul stated in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9. God is faithful by whom you are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. So what is the process of separation? First, the one not walking the light must be identified. In Romans the 16th chapter, verse 17, Paul urges brethren to note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, Brethren were commanded in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the, to the tradition which he received from the apostles. Anyone acting contrary to the doctrine which they learned from the apostles is causing divisions and offenses. Any brother who walks not according to the tradition, that is, the teaching of the, God, the apostles, is walking disorderly. It is these brethren from whom fellowship must be withdrawn if they will not repent. What does this withdrawal fellowship look like? Although the Jews got many things wrong about the coming of the anointed one, one thing they did know was how to withdraw fellowship. Jesus said the following, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you will have gained your brother. But if he will not hear you, take with you one or two more, and that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. That's Mark, uh, Matthew 18, chapter, verses 15 through 17. Now, the Jew would have not have any social intercourse with a heathen or tax collector. You will recall what Peter said to those gathered with Cornelius. You know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go to one of another nation, Acts 10, verse 28. This is how Jesus said to treat the unrepentant sinner, one who is walking disorderly. It would be presumptuous to try to modify his approach 
in any way. Paul had, also had something to say about how to withdraw fellowship in 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 11. In verses 1 through 5, he writes that it is actually reported there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality has, is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, and you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from, from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body but present in spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan, or the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved uh, in the day of the Lord. And this also kind of describes the church today, where we will tolerate all sorts of sins within the church. But it also says that someone as remote as Paul can refuse to have fellowship with uh, such one as this. Paul records later a list of sins that could not be tolerated by writing in 1 Corinthians 6, chapter verses 9 through 10, that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Are these not the things of the flesh that Paul seeks to destroy? Why, why of course. In chapter 5, continuing on with verses 6 through 8, he continues to say that your glorying, glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, or with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Even if the action taken against the erring brother does not bring about his repentance, it will at least remove the, the leavening influence on the church that the unrepentant brother will have if he is not isolated. Paul further writes in verses 9 through 11, I wrote to you in my epistle to, not to keep company with sexually immoral people, yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world, or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since you then would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother, that's a qualifying uh, condition, who is sexually immoral or covetous or an adulterer or a reviler or a drunkard or an extortioner, an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Why did Paul fail to mention the uh, wife uh, of the erring brother's uh, father? Was she not as guilty of sin as the erring brother? Indeed, she was. Since she was not mentioned, a reasonable assumption is that she was one of the sexual, sexually immoral people of the world. That is, she was not a Christian. Paul says not even to eat with the erring brother. A Jew would not eat with a heathen or a tax collector. That is how we are to treat an erring and unrepentant brother. Paul commanded the Thessalonian brethren in 2 Thessalonians 3, uh, verses uh, 6 through 7, that they withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly, not according to the tradition which he received from us, for yourselves, you yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we were not disorderly among you. That is, they were walking in the light. Paul further stated in verse 13, not to grow weary in doing good. Withdrawing from every brother who walks disorderly was doing good. And they were not to grow weary in the doing of it when necessary. In verses 14 and 15, Paul writes that if anyone does not obey our word in this, ep in this epistle, note that person and do not keep company with him that he may be ashamed. Yet do not count him as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. 
the action that is to be taken is to identify that person who does not obey the apostle's word and do not keep company with him. The action that constitutes not keeping company with him is to bring him to shame, thereby prompting his repentance. If the action is not designed to bring about his shame, then it is the wrong action. He is to be admonished as a brother and not as an enemy. His repentance is sincerely desired, all the while his leavening influence is to be isolated. The erring brother is not to be treated in any way that would signify to him that things can continue as it would, say, with the sexually immoral people of the world contemplated in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 10. As a commentator, Albert Barnes, uh, stated respecting chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, we see the object of Christian de uh, discipline. It is not revenge, hatred, malice, or mere exercise of power that is to lead to it. It is the good of the individual that is to be pursued and sought. While the church endeavors to remain pure, its aim and object should be mainly to correct and reform the offender, that his spirit may be saved. When discipline is undertaken, undertaken from any other motive than this, when it is pursued from, from private peak or rivalship, or ambition, or the love of power, when it seeks to overthrow the influence or standing of another, it is wrong. The salvation of the offender and the glory of God should prompt to all the measures which should be taken in the case. If then the Bible is so clear on the need, the method, and the purpose of corrective discipline, then why does it work so seldom? It is not because the method set forth in the scripture is in error. It is rather because the erring know that no one is going to try to do anything about it. Those of us who sit by and watch unconcerned and act as if no discipline has taken place are in sin as much as the one who has been disciplined and refuses to repent. While this is true in most churches Today, it is even more so when the disciplined one moves to another congregation, be it local or remote. I've heard it said that in, in uh, Tennessee, where there are just many, many churches of Christ, you know, no one cares if you've been disciplined. They just go to another congregation. There are plenty of them. And that's the last they've ever heard, of, heard about that uh, sin. It is typical that when a, a newcomer expresses a wish to place membership at a new congregation. No inquiry is made respecting the newcomer's uh, fellowship status at the former congregation. Furthermore, it is typically the case that when a member of the new congregation knows that the newcomer has been disciplined by the former congregation and remains un unrepentant, of course, nothing is said at all, such as informing the membership of the, of the newcomer's fellowship status. Indeed, the former member may welcome the unrepentant newcomer as a friend. Also, the new congregation, for the most part ignorant because they have no appropriate, uh, have made no appropriate inquiry, and the former member fails to inform the new congregation of the newcomer's fellowship status. And I might add that the new congregation uh, really may have no concern about it if they did know. <laughs> anyway, the they may invite the newcomer to preach and teach Bible classes. Now, we recognize that the new congregation could just as well invite an unrepentant uh, non-member to preach and teach Bible classes. This happens all the time because there is a general disregard for the authority of the scriptures. What about visiting, visiting the new congregation, perhaps at the invitation of a dear friend there, knowing how that congregation has or expresses no regard for the Bible's teaching on fellowship and that certain members, particularly the dear friend of the new congregation, know that an unrepentant person is preaching and teaching. If one has been paying any attention at all to this lesson, what possibly could the answer be? When there's a general disregard for the authority of the Bible, the Bible's teaching on fellowship 
will be disregarded as well, which of course is sin. If this question was posed to Aaron after the, after the death of his sons, Nadab and Abihu, what do you suppose his answer would be? Or Cain? Or Achan's friends? Or the man with his father's wife? Or Himenaeus and Alexander? And countless others? Well, to, to ask the question is an answer. We know what the answer is. So I implore you, please do not treat lightly the matter of fellowship or the breach of fellowship or the discipline in, in, imposed on the unrepentant or ignore the whole mechanism of discipline. A cavalier disregard for such matters does yourself spiritual harm, fails to bring repentance to the disobedient and results in an impure church. We pray to God that it be not so. We seem to have the idea that uh, those that have been withdrawn from, that's specific to a particular congregation, but it applies to no other congregation. That's just not true. The discipline follows the individual, and we must always keep that in mind. I'd like to offer this opportunity now for those who may have, I don't see any uh, visitors, but some of those may need to respond to the gospel's call for, for, for sin in their lives, to be rid of it and to make proper acknowledgments for the church, if uh, so required. Shall we do so as we stand and sing? <laughs>